If you got a Bible, I'd like you to open the book of Proverbs chapter one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the message. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I said, we've been on this series on Proverbs and I wanna read to you Proverbs one and verse five and I just have a very, very simple, fairly short message. It could be really long, but I'm gonna keep it short. Um, a fairly short message to, to share with you this morning that I believe can help you. And you know, you may be visiting us today and just sort of checking things out. You know, I, I get that. But don't be surprised if God ambushes you today. Amen. He knows us. And he knows the secret language of your heart. And he can speak it. I challenge you to listen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word, your eternal word. And through your Holy Spirit, may the truth of it dawn upon our hearts today. Thank you for correcting us, encouraging us, strengthening us, bringing comfort to us through your word. We give you our undivided attention to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Proverbs 1 in verse 5. It says, A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. That may be the main attribute of a wise person that we find throughout the book of Proverbs, spoken of again and again and again that the wise man or the wise woman has an open mind and an open heart. They will listen, they will consider, they will investigate and they will learn. Where a fool, according to the book of Proverbs, is only interested in their own perspective and their own opinion. The mind of a fool is a lot like cement, it's thoroughly mixed and well set. <laughs> a wise man, a wise woman will listen, will hear, and a fool will not hear. I want to read to you from Proverbs 2, the first seven verses, and it kind of gives an idea of what, what it really means to, to listen and to, you know, to, to lean into God for his wisdom. Proverbs 2 and verse 1, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to my wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you will cry out for discernment and lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. Notice it says that God stores up wisdom for the upright. He's not hiding it from them. It's stored up for them. It's stored up for you. It's stored up for me. And if we will search for it, if we will incline our ear, if we will listen, if we will literally give our attention to it, the Lord gives wisdom. This wisdom that he has stored up for you and for me, he will give it to us. He will make it known. And the fruit of, of hearing and acting upon his wisdom is, you know, joy. It's having a blessed family. It's having a long life, safety, health, prosperity, promotion, and on and on. You find those things in the book of Proverbs. It says that they come to those that will embrace God's wisdom. And I just want to say, whatever you're, facing right now. God has wisdom laid up for you. You may have just found out that your spouse has been unfaithful. You're shattered. God has wisdom stored up for you. You may be in between jobs right now. God has wisdom stored up for you. You may be battling with temptation. God has wisdom stored up for you. Maybe your son or your daughter just made some announcement to you about their sexuality. 
And it's rocked your world because you didn't see it coming. God has wisdom stored up for you. Maybe you have challenges with your business. God has wisdom for you. Maybe you grapple with depression. God has wisdom for you. He has a way for you to walk. Maybe you just have this idea or this dream and you don't know how to get started even. Listen, God sees you. He knows you. And he has wisdom stored up for you. And if you will listen and follow it, it will bring you through. And on the way, it will bring great temporal and eternal blessings into your life. But again, the key is to listen to and to hear his wisdom. And I've, I've made this really simple. I'm just going to sh share with you four things that if we'll listen to them, we'll find his wisdom. And I've made it into an acrostic, wise, W-I-S-E. If we listen to these four things, we will find God's wisdom in them. Number one, we need to listen to his word. We need to listen to the word of God. Again, I want to read the verses from Proverbs 2, verses 1 and 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. This is a book of God's wisdom, the Bible. You know, Moses, when he was talking to the children of Israel about the word that God had given him to give to them, this is what he said, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 5. He said, surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Moses said, look, the word that God gave me to give to you, this is your wisdom. Amen. In Luke eleven forty nine, 49, Jesus called the written word of God the wisdom of God. I had a guy come to me this was many years ago. He'd been coming to the church for, for a while. I'd met him a few times, and he asked if he could see me. I said, yeah. So he comes up into the office, and he is absolutely distraught. And he's talking about this issue he's got going on. He says, Pastor, I have begged God. I have pleaded with God to talk to me. Over and over, I've pleaded with him, and he hasn't spoken to me at all. And I was actually quite surprised because the issue he talked about, his question was actually addressed four or five times very clearly in the New Testament. Just, just, just clearly addressed. And so, you know, he got through and he was on the, the verge of tears. I said, I got a question. Do, do you have a Bible? He goes, yeah, of course. I said, don't be offended, but do you read it? He says, well, actually, Pastor, no, I don't. I said, okay. So I went and got a New Testament, and I showed him like three different places that addressed the issue that he talked about and what God had to say. We went to another one, went to another one. I said, what do you think? He said, I, I guess God's already said something about this, hasn't he? <laughs> I said, yep, he has. Let's imagine you've built this, this thriving business. I mean, it is, it's just firing on all cylinders, and you're going to take an extended trip. So before you go, you write this comprehensive handbook dealing with anything that could come up. And all the people you leave in charge, you give each of them a copy of this handbook. I mean, everything's in it from, you know, maintenance for the machinery to the vendors that you need to deal with, to how to deal with, with conflict with employees, everything that's been provided, everything that is expected, anything that could come up, you have addressed it in this handbook. So you go on this extended journey, and you come back, and you're shocked when you pull up in the parking lot, your building. The lights are off in the building, middle of the day. And you go, what the heck? You walk in, and it looks like, you know, a tornado has gone through the office, People are in there fighting. Um, the, the, 
the, the machines are all offline, production has stopped, and it's just, it's utter chaos inside. And so you, you pull all these people that you've left in charge, said, look, what has happened? How could you guys have let this happen? They said, well, we waited and waited for you to call to tell us what to do, but you never called. But the book, I, I left you a book. Well, but, but the machines went offline and, and we didn't know how to fix them and, and we, did, we didn't know which vendors to, to call and we didn't know when people were supposed to come into work or what was required. And, 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 and we waited several times. We we're hoping that you would call and do a Zoom call with us and tell us what to do. No, 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 no. The book. I gave you the book. All of those things are addressed in the book. And by the way, I did call a couple of times. You guys never picked up. God's given us a book. And yeah, he does call from time to time. But the truth is, when God makes a call, he calls your spirit. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Peter referred to our spirit as the hidden man of the heart, but most Christians are altogether unacquainted with their own heart. We make all this noise, we live in the mental realm. God doesn't speak to us in our mind, he speaks to us in our heart, our spirit. We make all this, we live in the physical realm, we live in the mental realm, we spend very little time in the spirit realm. So it's not that God doesn't call, very few of his children pick up when he calls. But, but that aside, He's given us a book. First place that, that we're going to find God's wisdom, we need to listen to his word. All right, the second place, the letter I, is integrity. We need to listen to integrity. Um, Proverbs 11 and verse 3, it says, the integrity of the upright will guide them but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them, right? The integrity of the upright will guide them. You know, Job said something beautiful about integrity, and I just, I'm gonna read it to you. It's from Job 27, and, and I've chosen to do it from the Message Bible. It's great in virtually every translation, but I really like this one. Job said this, Job 27, verse three, but as long as I draw my breath, <clears throat> And for as long as God breathes life into me, I refuse to say one word that isn't true. I refuse to confess to any charges that are false. There is no way I'll ever agree to your accusations. I'll not deny my integrity, even if it costs me my life. I'm holding fast to my integrity and not loosening my grip. And believe me, I'll never regret it. King David said in Psalm 26, 11, but as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Walk means a lifestyle. This is how I'm going to conduct my life. I will walk in my integrity. My friend, once you have made that decision, three-fourths of the rest of the decisions you'll ever make for the rest of your life, they're already made automatically. You make the decision to walk in your integrity, be guided by integrity, three-fourths of life's decisions, they're automatically made. If it causes me to violate my integrity, the answer is no. The decision is made. If it gets me in trouble, or if it makes me unpopular, or if it makes me or you uncomfortable, as long as I draw my breath, I will hold fast to my integrity. Let's say you have a yard sit. And you, you and your wife, you've upgraded and you've gotten a new kitchen table, so you're selling this old one. You really like it. It's a nice table. And it's sort of the gem of everything you have out at this yard sale. And uh, I mean, it's like 7 in the morning. You know, you always got those early people that come before you, you, you know, put in the paper, done home till late, but you know somebody's going to come at 7. That's just what some people do. So this guy comes, and he right away walks over to the table and says, man, that's a nice table. Um, how much you want for it? 
Well, we were hoping to get a couple hundred dollars for it. Uh, it's kind of a lot. Tell you what, I'll give you a hundred. No, we're not selling it for a hundred. I'll give you 125. How about 175? Nah, about 150. You go, all right, sold, 150 bucks. And the guy says, well, you know, I wasn't expecting to spend this much. I'm going to have to drive home and get the money. I'll be back within an hour, but deal, right? So you shake hands with the guy. He says, okay, thank you. I'll be back within an hour. As he's driving away, another early bird drives up. Guy gets out, walks up in your driveway, nice table. You say, it's already sold, man. Already sold? Yeah, it's already sold. Why is it still here? Well, the guy didn't have the money on him. He went home to get it. How much you sell it to him for? 150. You're kidding. I'll give you 175 right now. <laughs> no, I told you it's already sold. I give you 200 for it right now. He said, you don't understand. I gave the man my word. No. It doesn't matter if you offer me $2,000 for the table. My integrity is not for sale at any price. The integrity of the upright will guide them. Listen, if, if you compromise your conscience or your integrity to gain something, you will eventually lose that thing. And you'll lose some more valuable things along the way. I was uh, preaching in a certain state one time, and this guy that I had met, he was actually the president of a large corporation. You know, he knew I was going to be there. He asked me if I'd go golf with him. I said, sure. And so he takes me to his private golf course, you know, that, that he's a member at. Really nice golf course. And, you know, if, if, if we're going to get out and golf, and it's a casual game, and you're going to take mulligans, are you going to improve your life? That's fine. Let's just establish that before we start. It's that kind of a game, okay? We're just out here to, you know, take a five-mile walk, and if you want to hit an extra ball, not a worry. You want to take a mulligan, no problem. But let's establish it before we start. Otherwise, let's play golf. You know, there are rules to the game of golf. Well, we're going to play, and like on the third hole, he starts cheating. He hits it like four feet into the rough, got this buried lie, and I, he doesn't think I'm watching. He moves it over into the edge of the fairway where he's got a perfect lie. Hits a great shot. Two holes later, he does it again. Three holes later, he does it again. Next hole, he hits it under the lip of the, the sand trap in the bunker. I think, oh, you're dead. He moves the ball five feet, <laughs> gives himself a perfect shot, hits it up next to the pin, sinks the putt, we get done. He's done this all day long. We get done. He adds up the score. Says, well, Bayless, looks like I beat you by two strokes today. The Holy Spirit was really with me. And I'm like, yeah, there was a spirit with you, but he wasn't holy. And somebody says, what's this? It's just a game of golf. Granted, it is. But as much as we like to compartmentalize our lives, God doesn't see it that way. It's just your life. And what you do in one compartment, is, as much as you like to seal that compartment up, it will always bleed over into all the other areas of your life, always. And it was probably three months, maybe four months later, this guy violated his integrity in a much more serious, serious area. It cost him his reputation and almost cost him his marriage. Walk in integrity. Listen to integrity. It's the wisdom of God. All right, number, number three is the letter I. You're listening. <laughs> letter S stands for shalom. Listen to shalom. Peace. Proverbs 3 and verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. We come down to verse 17, talking about wisdom. Her, that is wisdoms. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. The Hebrew word shalom. All of wisdom's paths are peace. 
If you're walking down a pathway that is God's wisdom for your life, it's going to be peace, shalom in your heart. That doesn't mean that, that doubts won't assail your mind. That doesn't mean that fear won't try and grip your mind. But as you lean into that, that thing that you're doing and, and this way you're considering to go, if it's wisdom, there'll be peace. In fact, it said all of her, all of wisdom's ways are pleasantness. The Hebrew word pleasantness means to be polished smooth as opposed to something that has a jagged or a rough edge, something that will scratch you. You know, I went to put a pair of socks on the other day, and I didn't realize it. Just my little toe, toenail split on the, the edge of the toenail. I go to put the sock on, it, it snags. Darn. So I go to put it back on, smooth and ah. Now, I know that's a little thing, but that's kind of the idea. You know, you're praying about doing this certain thing, but there's just this little hitch inside. If something is scratching you internally. Just, just something catches. It's just not, not a smooth idea you're trying to put on. And when you pray about it and lean into it, it's just, just this little... Eh. Friend, listen to that. All of wisdom's paths are peace. And I, I've shared this story before, but I, I had some friends that they, they recommended to me uh, that I speak to these businessmen. And so I did. And they, they said, look, they've got this deal and it's just awesome. So these two business guys come and talk to me about this, this investment thing for churches. Minimum buy-in is a quarter of a million bucks. But it's like, I mean, it sounds like the, the best thing since sliced bread. And virtually everybody that I, everyone in my circle of friends, everyone, every single pastor in church had invested in this thing. And a number of large national and international ministries had invested in it. And they're telling me this thing and the returns that'll happen. And, and I just, I'm, it sounds so good. And all my friends have recommended it. But when I try and put the pair of socks on, something catches. It's not big but I've just got, something's not smooth. And I go, guys, you know, I just, I'm not sure about this. And they, they really pressed me and I said, you know what, can I talk to you tomorrow? Well, let me pray about it tonight. They said, okay. So I pray about it and you know, when I, when I, I get on my knees and I'm, I'm leaning in towards that and very distinct, you know, something's just, just this little, Pitch. So the next day, they, they come back to the church, and I said, guys, you know, thank you for your time, thank you for coming, but I'm not going to do it. And man, they really laid it on. They said, you know, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. This is God's end-time strategy to fund his kingdom. And all of these guys that are investing, and my friends had told me, said, Bayless, I mean, there's a check there every month. The returns are there like clockwork. It's amazing. And these guys said, you know, they're going to be able to fund their vision and everything God's told them to do. And, and you're going to be, you know, out on the, the wayside somewhere. They, tell you, they said, this is God's end time strategy for the kingdom of God in the world right now. And they just made me feel about this big, like I was just stupid with a capital S. I said, guys, I'm so glad that other people have invested in it. I just can't do it. I don't have peace. And they, they actually left angry. About four months later, five months later, came out, they were crooks. And they'd stolen somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 million. They, they ended up going to prison over it, but all of the churches, all of the ministries lost all that money. We need to listen. All of wisdom's paths peace. And I know some of you here, listen, it's not a coincidence we're together today. You're praying about certain things. You're leaning into something right now. All her ways are ways of pleasantness. All her paths, all of wisdom's paths are peace. Again, that doesn't mean that doubt won't assail our mind. It doesn't mean that, that you know, I'm not going to uh, have second thoughts here. But when I get quiet in that place of prayer and I put my time in, Peace is going to speak to me. You know, the New Testament, Colossians 3 and 15, it says this, 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The Greek word rule there literally means to act as an umpire. Let the peace of God act as an umpire in your heart. What does an umpire do? Say, hey, that's, that's out of bounds. That, that's fair territory. Keep going. You're safe right there. See, the umpire makes a call. If I'm praying about a thing and I've got that, that hitch inside, umpire's making a call. That's out of bounds. Yeah. Don't keep going. Yeah. But if I pray about it, even if it doesn't make sense to my natural mind and I've got this inward peace, the umpire's making a call. You know, you, you keep going in that direction. Listen to that verse from the Amplified Bible. I'm just going to read it. It won't be on the screen. Just listen. It says, And let the peace from Christ act as umpire continually, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds. Let the peace from Christ, let the peace of God act as an umpire continually in your heart, settling Deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your mind. Once I've got peace about something, I don't, I just go. I make the biggest decisions, the biggest decisions in my life based on the umpire's call. It, it settles it, decides it with finality. All of wisdom's paths are peace. And I got about four more illustrations that I want to unload on you, but I promised <laughs> that I would be short. But I will give you one. <laughs> you know, um, we uh, had a, we built a previous building prior to the campus here. And it was a huge stretch for us. It was two, 2.4 acres and... Um, you know, to buy the property and build the building, I went to the bank and talked them into giving us a $2 million loan. Now, that may not sound like a lot right now, but then it was astronomical. I mean, my wife and I just bought our first house for $88,000. Today, that same house, they're selling for a million dollars on the street there. We pay $88,000. So back then, what I'm talking about, a million bucks was a million bucks. And here I'm going to borrow $2 million, more money than I'd ever thought about in my life. And I, I will be honest with you, you know, they're, they're getting the paperwork ready and everything, and I got a ping pong match going on in my brain. I am back and forth, back and forth. I'm thinking, God, you know, if this thing doesn't work, they won't be able to find you, but they know where I live. <laughs> and I mean, fear is gripping my mind. And I'm literally just kind of tormented inside. And I, and I was putting my time and praying, and I'm just still back and forth and back and forth. And finally, it's, it's the next morning I have to go to the bank and sign the papers. And I'm freaking out. And so I spent a long time praying that night, fell asleep, and I woke up in the morning. And the moment I woke up, there was a tangible sense of God's peace and resting on my heart. That was it. I didn't pray about it anymore. Just drove down to the bank, took care of everything, and that was the easiest thing to pay off that we've ever done in our, our whole lives or in the whole you know, time of the ministry. Let the peace of God act as an umpire continually, <laughs> deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your mind. All of wisdom's pathways are peace. And then finally, our final letter in the word wise is E. That stands for experts. Listen to the experts, those that have already been down the road that you're going down, those that have already had a bit more life experience than you, that maybe have done some of the things that you're, you're wanting to do. Listen to them. Proverbs 11 and verse 14 says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans go awry but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Listen, if all of your girlfriends are telling you, like, what the heck are you doing with that guy? Maybe you ought to listen to him. Maybe they're seeing something you're not seeing. Maybe you're a little bit starstruck. Maybe just the fact that somebody's paying attention to you and they seem genuine, well, it just might be that some of your counselors 
Maybe see something that you don't see. Now, if the counsel that others give you is different from what you believe the Lord has spoken to your heart, pray more about it. Ultimately, you will have to give an account to God for the decisions that you make. We understand that. They won't. You will. But others can help point out things that you haven't considered, things you haven't thought through that can help you. Everything from timing to motives. Some decisions, you just don't want to make them in a vacuum, my friend. Proverbs 18.1 says, A man who isolates himself, seeks his own desire, he rages against all wise judgment. Isolation leads to crazy thinking. The man, the woman that, that isolates himself, isolates herself, rages against all wise judgment. We need others. I was staying down in Mexico City one time doing some ministry, and I was actually staying in the home of Wayne Myers. He is the grandfather-in-law of Harrison's, Bethany's grandfather, great missionary to Mexico, and now he's 102, I think, and still going. And uh, I was staying in his home, and every morning we'd get up before light, and he'd throw a couple logs on the fire, and we would worship God and pray together for about an hour every morning. And there, there was an issue I was facing. And I just had kind of looked at it from every angle and prayed about it and gone to the Word. I just was still, I don't know, I just couldn't see my way clear. So one morning after we get done, I said, Wayne, I, I need some wisdom. I said, here's what's going on. I laid the whole thing out before him. And for about the next 30 minutes, he just shared his perspective on things and how he would recognize when God was speaking to him. And I don't know how it happened exactly, but suddenly, just listening to his counsel, all the pieces fit together for me. And so I made the phone call. There weren't no mobile phones, no personal computers at that time. I got on a landline and called back here to the States. I said, look, um, regarding that issue, I'm out. And uh, made some people upset. But... Looking back, I, I would have gone a different direction had I not received that counsel. I would have made a mistake that would have hurt me for years and years to come. So thankful for the counsel of wise people, the experts, if you would, people that have been down the track ahead of you and ahead of me. They, they can share things that will help us. And the truth is, if we're going to be wise, we need to listen. We need to hear. We need to listen to the word, listen to integrity, listen to shalom, and listen to the experts. And the wisest thing that you'll ever do is to get your business with God taken care of. If you've never sorted things out between you and God, there's nothing more important for you to do. The wisest thing you can do is take care of your spiritual life. Make sure that you're secure in your relationship with God. You know, there's a Bible word in the New Testament. It's the word peace. And the most common word for peace in the New Testament literally means to join together that which has been severed. To rejoin something that's been broken apart or torn apart. And that's what Christ came to do, to rejoin us together with God. The Bible says that Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross. And interesting, you look in the Genesis account, and you know, God makes the land, and then it says that he brought the trees out of the soil. And then he, he brought fish, he, he made the, the seas, and then he brought fish out of the seas, and then he made man out of himself. God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living being living soul. Well, you know, if you take a tree and you separate it from the soil, its natural environment, it dies. You take a fish and you separate it from the water, from its natural environment, it dies. You take a man, you separate him from God, he dies, spiritually. God told Adam in the garden, he said, look, if you ever choose to step out from under my authority and you want to decide for yourself what's right and wrong, he says, the day you do that, you'll die. And in the Hebrew language, the word die is there, it's there twice. 
you'll die, die. Adam, you'll die a double death. And he did die that day he disobeyed God. He died spiritually. He was separated from God. And the truth is we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, the scripture says. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, that state of spiritual death is passed to all humanity through Adam, through Eve, the fountainheads of the human race. And every one of us, you know, has had that sense in our lives that, that something's missing. I had this, this great Grand Canyon-sized void in my life that I tried to fill with girls. I tried to fill it with drugs. I tried to fill it with excessive alcohol. I tried to fill it with extreme things. I tried to fill it with, with anything you can imagine, but it's a God-shaped hole. We are taken out of God because of our sins separated. The Bible says in Isaiah, I believe, chapter 59, your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you. But Jesus came as our substitute. He was perfect and holy and he did nothing wrong. And he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became our substitute. On that cross, as he hung there, suspended between heaven and earth, the judgment and wrath of God against your sin and my sin was laid upon Jesus. He literally took our sin upon himself and he died under the weight of that sin. Three days and three nights later when the claims of God's eternal justice had been satisfied, Jesus was raised from the dead. And now when we put our trust in him, the one who has made sin for us, his righteousness is now placed upon us. Complete substitution. The innocent for the guilty the righteous for the unholy. He took our place so that we could have his place and be reunited with God. If you've never experienced what I'm talking about, being reconnected with your creator, you can be. Now, it's not anything that somebody else can do for you. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. You need to come to him yourself. You, you might be here, somebody, and your, your daddy was a, a Methodist pastor. Or your daddy, your, un, your uncle, your grandpa was a Baptist pastor. Or maybe a Pentecostal pastor. That's great that you have that heritage, but you cannot get into the kingdom hanging on to their coattails. You have to make your own decision. And you may be in here, and you're living a wild and a woolly life right now. You know you are. You're, you, you're manipulating people. You are shacking up with another man's wife. There's all sorts of stuff you're doing that you know is wrong and self-destructive probably on a, a few levels. I just want to encourage you. God loves you. And he's touching your heart right now. Things can change if you let him change. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes if you would just for a minute. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. If you'll tie your heart around the words and be sincere, I believe that God will, will meet you. It's going to be a, a prayer where we confess the Lordship of Jesus. And the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. If you confess him with your mouth as Lord, you will be saved. Just speak these words to God right now. And if it helps you, speak them out loud. Or at least let your, your lips form the words as you Put a sincere heart behind him. Just say, oh God, I come to you. With all of my heart, I believe. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he took my place on the cross. That he died for my sins. I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, I ask you now, come into my life. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. All I am and all I have, put in your hands, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.